Were the pyramids built before the flood? According to creation scientists, the great flood in Noah's day occurred about 2350 BC, and then the Tower of Babel event would have occurred sometime after that, and then the Great Pyramids of Giza would have been built sometime after that. But according to Egyptologists, the Great Pyramids of Giza were built about 2550 BC, about 200 years before the flood. But wait a minute now, how could the Egyptians have built the pyramids a whole 200 years before the flood when the nation of Egypt didn't even exist until after the Tower of Babel? That doesn't make any sense. The Great Pyramids do not have any signs of water damage. If the pyramids were built before the flood and are still standing after the flood, then that would mean the pyramids would have been completely submerged in the floodwaters and should have a significant amount of water damage. But they don't. The Great Pyramids do not have a significant amount of water damage. And so, since Egyptian history predates Noah's flood and continues on after the flood, unaffected by it, then skeptics say that either a worldwide flood never happened, or biblical history must be inaccurate. This is, uh, this is heavy duty, Doc. However, the pyramids are built on top of sedimentary layers which contain fossils. Creation scientists say that these layers were laid down during the flood, which is evidence that the pyramids would have been built after the flood, not before it. Also, the name Egypt in Hebrew is Mizraim. Mizraim is the son of Ham and the grandson of Noah. So clearly, the Egyptians are the descendants of Noah's grandson. But Noah didn't even begin to have grandsons until after they stepped off the ark. So clearly, Egyptian history could not have begun until after the flood. So instead of questioning biblical history, it makes more sense to question Egyptian history. Is Egyptian history really accurate? Well, according to an award-winning documentary called Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus, some scholars believe that Egyptian history has been dated incorrectly and needs a major adjustment. Experts like John Bimson and David Roll believe that Egyptian history needs to move forward on the timeline by about 200 years, and the documentary shows some compelling evidence supporting this claim. And when you correct the inaccuracies on the Egyptian timeline, then all of a sudden Egyptian history lines up perfectly with the events of the Exodus. This documentary is the winner of 13 film festival awards and was the number one best-selling documentary on Walmart and Amazon for two weeks in a row. It's also available on iTunes and on Netflix. Now, if these experts are correct, that Egyptian history needs to move forward on the timeline by 200 years, then this would mean that the pyramids would not have been built about 2550 BC, but rather they would have been built about 200 years after that, about 2350 BC, making the pyramids contemporary with the flood in Noah's day. So that solves the problem, right? Well, no, it doesn't, because that doesn't leave any time for the Tower of Babel event to have taken place. Also, the Great Pyramids of Giza are not the oldest pyramids. The Step Pyramid at Saqqara is the very first Egyptian pyramid ever built, and it predates the Great Pyramids of Giza by about 100 years, which would place the Step Pyramid at about 2450 BC, which still predates the Flood by about 100 years. So you see, even when you correct the inaccuracies on the Egyptian timeline so that it lines up with the events of the Exodus, that still doesn't solve the problem. The pyramids still predate the Flood, which means that the only option left over is you have to question the biblical timeline. Great Scott! I know, this is heavy. Now that's not to say that you should question biblical authority, but rather, is the timeline presented by creation scientists really even biblical at all? Well, according to the Greek Septuagint, it's not. What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. You see, in a previous video that I made called How Long Were the Israelites in Egypt, I pointed out the fact that modern Bible translations are translated from the Hebrew Masoretic text, which is not the original Hebrew, but rather it's a copy of the Hebrew called the Leningrad Codex, which was copied in the 11th century AD. But the Greek Septuagint was translated more than a thousand years before that in 250 BC and would not have been translated from the Hebrew Masoretic, but rather it would have been translated from a different copy of the Hebrew, an older copy which is no longer around today. The Samaritan Pentateuch also predates the Masoretic text and would also have referenced an older copy of the Hebrew. The same is true of the writings of Flavius Josephus and of Paul the Apostle. And according to these four witnesses, the original Hebrew text said that the Israelites were in Egypt 
and Canaan for 430 years. And that's the way that Exodus 1240 was written in the original Hebrew, but more than a thousand years later when the Hebrew Masoretic text was copied, that phrase, and Canaan, was dropped out of the text. And since all of our Bibles are translated from this corrupted copy of the Hebrew, then all of our Bibles say that the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years, which is incorrect and mathematically impossible. The truth is, they were in Egypt for only half that time for 215 years. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then I suggest you watch this video first. Now, what I didn't explain in this video is the fact that this is not the only thing that the Masoretic Text has dropped out. There are other things the Masoretic text has dropped out causing major distortions in the biblical timeline, and these distortions make it seem like the pyramids were built before the flood. Let me explain. You see, in Genesis chapter 11, it gives a genealogy from Shem all the way down to Abram, and it says how old each person was when their son was born. So it says that Arphaxed was 35 when his son was born, and Shelah was 30 when his son was born. But in the Greek Septuagint, it says that Arphaxed was 135, and it says that Shelah was 130. The Greek Septuagint has an extra 100 years on those ages. In the six generations from Arphaxed down to Sarug, the Hebrew Masoretic text says that they were in their 30s when their son was born. But the Greek Septuagint says that they were in their 130s. The Greek Septuagint has an extra 100 years on each one of those ages. But it's not just the Greek Septuagint. The Samaritan Pentateuch includes those extra hundred years, and so does Flavius Josephus. Now remember, the Bible says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Well, we've got three witnesses here that are all in a hundred percent agreement that the original Hebrew text included those extra hundred years on those ages from Arphaxad down to Sarug. And we already know that these three bear witness that the original Hebrew text included that phrase and Canaan when the Masoretic text has dropped it out. Now, let me explain why I think that these extra hundred years belong, and it has nothing to do with the pyramids, but rather it has to do with the Bible itself. You see, if you take these ages that are in the Hebrew Masoretic text and you plot these on a chart, then you'll notice something really strange. You'll notice that Shem would have outlived almost all of his sons and grandsons down to the 8th generation. Now, I've heard it said before that the loss of a child is considered to be the worst possible grief. You're going to be all right. You're... <sighs> uh. Well, if this is really true, that the loss of a child is the worst possible grief, well then Shem must have gone through a whole lot of grief. Because according to the Hebrew Masoretic text, Shem would have witnessed the death of his son, he would have witnessed the death of his grandson, he would have witnessed the death of his great-great-grandson, his great-great-great-grandson, his great-great-great-great-grandson, his great-great-great-great-great-grandson, and his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandson. Now, why would God put Shem through so much grief? And what's causing this anyway? I mean, I understand that Shem lived before the flood, but why would that make him like a superman after the flood, outliving almost all of his sons and grandsons down to the eighth generation? That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Shem man. But according to these three witnesses, the original Hebrew text included an extra hundred years on those ages from Arphaxad down to Sarug. And when you put those extra hundred years back under those ages, and you plot the rest of this chart according to the ages that are in the Greek Septuagint, then all of a sudden everything makes perfect sense. Shem died before his son, Arphaxad died before his son, Shelah died before his son. Each generation died in succession, one after the other, which is normal for a genealogy. Any normal child with average intelligence who reads the genealogy in Genesis 11 is going to get the impression that the fathers were dying before the sons. That's the way of life. That's the impression that the scriptures give. And according to these three witnesses, that's exactly the way that it happened. Hello? Hello? Anybody home? Hey! Think with flies! And so according to these three witnesses, and a little common sense, the original Hebrew text included an extra hundred years on those ages from Arphaxad down to Sarug. But more than a thousand years later, when the Hebrew Masoretic text was copied, those extra hundred years were dropped off of those ages. Erased from existence. And since all of our Bibles are translated from this corrupted copy of the Hebrew, then all of our Bibles are missing those extra hundred years.
which has grossly distorted our understanding of the biblical timeline. Obviously, the time continuum has been disrupted, creating this new temporal event sequence resulting in this alternate reality. English, Doc. Now, creation scientists like Kent Hovind have put together a longevity chart from Adam to Joseph. And in this chart, he has Shem outliving almost all of his sons and grandsons, and he says that Shem would have known Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You won't notice this reading your Bible either, but when you graph out the dates, it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. Noah's son Shem lived long enough after the flood to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, if you're 130, but you know a 600-year-old that lives around the corner, you just don't feel so old anymore. But the truth is, Shem died about 500 years before Abraham was even born. Shem could not have personally known Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which explains the lack of dialogue between them. Answers in Genesis made a book about Noah's Ark, and in that book, they have a timeline. And in that timeline, they have Shem dying after the birth of Abraham. Sorry, but that's not correct. Shem did not die after the birth of Abraham. Shem died about 500 years before the birth of Abraham. Answers in Genesis also gets it wrong. When creation scientists say that the flood occurred about 2350 BC, they're basing this primarily upon the calculations of James Usher. But James Usher based his calculations upon the genealogies that are in the Hebrew Masoretic text. But, according to these three witnesses, the original Hebrew text included an extra hundred years on those ages from Arphaxad down to Sarug. And when you put an extra hundred years back onto six generations, then that adds an extra six hundred years of history. In fact, there's also an issue with the seventh generation, with the age of Nahor. The Hebrew Masoretic text says that Nahor was 29 years old when his son was born, but the Greek Septuagint says that he was 79. The Samaritan Pentateuch also agrees that he was 79, whereas Flavius Josephus never specifies. Well, that's at least two witnesses right there. So take 79 and subtract 29, and that's an extra 50 years of history, meaning that the original Hebrew text included an extra 650 years of history which means that the flood would not have occurred about 2350 BC, but rather it would have occurred about 650 years before that, about 3000 BC. Great Scott! Now I may have seriously altered history. And so if the flood occurred about 3000 BC, and the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara was built about 2450 BC, well then there's no legitimate reason to be looking for water damage on the pyramids. The pyramids were not submerged in the floodwaters, because at the time when the flood occurred, the very first Egyptian pyramid would not be built until another 550 years into the future, not hundreds of years in the past. Well, that's all in the past. You mean the future? Whatever! This would explain why the pyramids are built on top of sedimentary layers which were laid down during the flood. Also, 550 years is plenty of time for the world to repopulate, for the Tower of Babel event, and for nations to have spread all over the earth. You see, atheists sometimes say that there wasn't enough time for the Tower of Babel event to have taken place and for nations to have spread all over the earth. The reason why atheists say this is because most creation scientists are in agreement that the Tower of Babel event occurred just before the birth of Peleg. You see, the Bible says that the name Peleg means divided, and it says that his father named him this, for in his days the earth was divided. Well, at the time when they were building the tower, they were all living in the same place and they were all speaking the same language, meaning that the earth was united. But in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided, meaning that it was not united. This is a very clear indication that his father named him this just after the dispersion at Babel, when God confused the languages and they all split off in their own separate directions. In fact, Peleg's father is Heber, sometimes written as Eber, and Heber witnessed the events at Babel. Heber was there when it happened. And when Heber and his family split off in their own separate direction, they were speaking their own language. They were speaking the language of Heber, which is why it's called the Hebrew language, because it's named after him. I'm writing this down. This is good stuff. Yeah. So clearly, the Tower of Babel event occurred within the lifetime of Eber, just before the birth of his son Peleg. Flavius Josephus says, Salah was the son of Arphaxad, and his son was Heber, from whom they originally called the Jews Hebrews. Heber begat Joktan and Peleg. He was called Peleg because he was born at the dispersion of the nations to their several countries. For Peleg, among the Hebrews, signifies division.
Well, according to the Masoretic text, there was only about a hundred year time period in between the flood in Noah's day and the birth of Peleg. Apparently, atheists have done the math and have decided that a hundred years was not enough time for the population to have grown from eight people to a large enough number in order to build the Tower of Babel. After all, if the Great Pyramid of Khufu required 30,000 workers, well then surely the Great Tower of Babel would have required many more workers than that. But you simply cannot get that many workers in only a hundred years. Even if you go with a very generous growth rate of 3.2%, which is the growth rate of some of the most fastest growing countries in our world today, and you start with the eight people who came off the ark, then in a hundred years you'd only end up with about 186 people. 186. That's it. That is simply not enough people to build a city with an enormous tower. I may not be an expert on population growth rates, but I'd say these atheists have a pretty valid argument. However, according to these three witnesses, the original Hebrew text included an extra hundred years on those ages from Arphaxad down to Sarug. And when you put those extra hundred years back onto those ages, then you'll find there's about a 400 year time period in between the flood in Noah's day and the birth of Peleg. I think that 400 years is plenty of time for the population to have grown to a large enough size in order to build the Tower of Babel. After all, if you go with the exact same growth rate of 3.2% and you start with the eight people who came off the ark, then in 400 years, you'd end up with about 2.3 million people. If the largest pyramid only required 30,000 workers, well then I think 2.3 million people is enough to build the Tower of Babel. And so if our Bibles were consistent with the original Hebrew, well then atheists would not have made this claim to begin with. In order to go from 8 people to 30,000 people in only 100 years, you'd need a growth rate of 8.58%. However, this is not a realistic growth rate. Just to put this in perspective for you, if you go with an 8.58% growth rate and you start with the 8 people who came off the ark, then in 400 years you'd end up with 159 trillion people. Okay, there's not even 1 trillion people alive on earth today, thousands of years later. You're not going to get 159 trillion people in only 400 years. Clearly, an 8.58% growth rate is not realistic. And yet, that's the kind of growth rate that you would need in order to get 30,000 people in only 100 years. So clearly, the original Hebrew text included those extra 100 years on those ages from Arphex head down to Sarug. Now, if the Tower of Babel event occurred about 400 years after the flood, well, then that still leaves about a 150-year time period in between the dispersion at Babel and the building of the very first Egyptian pyramid. I think that 150 years is plenty of time for the descendants of Mizraim to have left the land of Babel and to have arrived in the land of Egypt. And so when you understand biblical history correctly, and you understand Egyptian history correctly, then all of a sudden everything makes perfect sense. But this only works if you follow the original Hebrew, not the corrupted Hebrew Masoretic. <laughs> Also, creation scientists say that the world is about 6,000 years old, but this is based upon the genealogies that are in the Hebrew Masoretic text. But if the original Hebrew text included an extra 650 years of history, then this would take the age of the earth up to at least 6,650, meaning that the world is closer to being 7,000 years old, not 6,000 like creation scientists claim. Now, please don't think that the Greek Septuagint is perfect. It's not perfect. For example, in Genesis chapter 11, you may have noticed that the Greek Septuagint includes an extra Canaan in between Arphaxad and Shelah. The book of Luke chapter 3 in the genealogy of Jesus also includes this extra Canaan in between Arphaxad and Shelah. This extra Canaan does not belong. The oldest known copies of the Greek Septuagint do not include this extra Canaan. Only newer copies do. The oldest known copies of the book of Luke do not include this extra Canaan. Only newer copies do. The Samaritan Pentateuch does not include it. Flavius Josephus does not include it. The Hebrew Masoretic does not include it. Even 1 Chronicles 118 does not include it in either the Greek or the Hebrew. This extra Canaan was added in to newer copies of the Greek when it should not have been. So you can just ignore this extra Canaan here. It doesn't belong. And I did not include that extra Canaan in this chart. So in case you're wondering why it's not there, now you know. The question is, though, is why would the Jewish scribes drop those years off of those ages? Why would they do that? Was it on purpose, or was it an accident? And if it was on purpose, then what was their motive? 
Well, I think that it was on purpose, and I think that their motive was to disprove what the book of Hebrews says about Jesus being the new high priest. You see, the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the new high priest. Now, any Jewish person knows that in order to be a priest, you have to come from the tribe of Levi. But Jesus didn't come from Levi, he arose from the tribe of Judah, and priests don't come from the tribe of Judah. So, according to the law, Jesus cannot be the new high priest. But the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the new high priest, not according to the Levitical priesthood, but according to a different priesthood, according to a higher priesthood, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, the book of Hebrews says something really interesting about Melchizedek. It says that he had no father and no mother, no genealogy, no beginning of days, and no end of life. Apparently, Melchizedek must be some sort of a divine or immortal being, perhaps like one of the sons of God talked about in Genesis chapter 6. Whatever the case, the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the new high priest, not according to the fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. Now, Jewish rabbis have decided that they would disprove what the book of Hebrews says about Melchizedek by claiming that Melchizedek is the same person as Shem, the son of Noah. Now, with Shem, we know who his father and his mother were. It was Noah and his wife. We know what his genealogy is because it's recorded in Genesis. We know he had beginning of days and end of life because we know when he was born and when he died. And so by saying that Shem is the same person as Melchizedek, that would disprove what the book of Hebrews says about Melchizedek. Not only that, but this would mean that Melchizedek is not of a different or a higher priesthood, but rather he would be the ancestral founder of the Levitical priesthood. Rabbis say that Shem handed the priesthood down to Abraham, who then handed it down to Isaac and then to Jacob and eventually down to Levi. This would mean that Melchizedek is of the same priesthood, not a different one. And rabbis say that the only way for Jesus to be the new high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, is he would have to inherit that priesthood from Levi, just like Levi inherited the priesthood from Melchizedek. But since Jesus is not a descendant of Levi, then Jesus cannot be the new high priest. And this is the argument that Jewish rabbis use even to this day. Unlike Christianity, our tradition tells us who was Melchizedek. He wasn't an angel or God himself like the Christians teach, but was actually Shem the son of Noah, who transferred the title of priest over to Abraham and then on through Isaac, Jacob, Levi, and ultimately Aaron. Now, the problem with this argument, though, is that Melchizedek lived the same time as Abraham. Melchizedek interacted with Abraham. Melchizedek brought out bread and wine to Abraham, and Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. But Shem died about 500 years before Abraham was even born. How did Shem bring out bread and wine to Abraham when he had been dead for the past 500 years? Clearly, Shem cannot be the same person as Melchizedek. There's about a 500-year gap in there preventing them from being the same person. And so it appears that a long time ago, some Jews decided to conspire with the scribes and have them drop those years off of those ages. That way, they could distort the genealogy in such a way to where the lifetime of Shem now overlaps the lifetime of Abraham. This way, they can say that Shem lived the same time as Abraham and then begin to promote the idea that Shem is the same person as Melchizedek. It's all an illusion. Oh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. In fact, if you ever read an article that says that Shem is Melchizedek, you'll notice that the only evidence that they provide is they'll say, look at the genealogy. Shem lived the same time as Abraham. Okay, but where's the rest of the evidence? They might quote the book of Jasher or the Targum or some commentary by a rabbi, but those aren't scripture. Where's the scriptural evidence that clearly says that Shem is Melchizedek? There isn't any. Now, those years were not necessarily dropped out in the 11th century when the Leningrad Codex was copied. They might have been dropped out in an earlier copy of the Masoretic. In fact, they might have been dropped out in a copy of the Hebrew that dates all the way back to the days of Paul the Apostle. And if that's the case, then that might be why Paul warned Titus and Timothy not to get involved in foolish arguments and disputes about genealogies, nor to give heed to Jewish fables. Now, what is Paul talking about here? Why would the Jews want to argue with Christians about genealogies? Hmm...
Maybe it's because they distorted the genealogies in their attempt to disprove Christianity. And maybe that distorted genealogy is the one and only single piece of evidence that even remotely supports this ridiculous anti-Christian fable that Shem is the same person as Melchizedek and therefore Jesus can't be the new high priest. Maybe that's what Paul was talking about. So you see, not only do we have evidence that those years were dropped out, but now we know of a motive as to why they would want to drop them out. And that's why I suspect that this is not just some accidental copyist error, like when the Greek Septuagint includes an extra Canaan. No, I suspect that the Jewish scribes dropped out those years on purpose with the intent to deceive. No, it wasn't me. It was the one-armed man. All right, I confess. I did it, you hear? And I'm glad. Glad, I tell you! As a matter of fact, in 1947, there were some ancient Hebrew scrolls that were discovered in some caves on the outskirts of the Dead Sea, known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. These are hundreds of fragments of ancient Hebrew scrolls that were carefully pieced together and dated all the way back to the 2nd and 3rd centuries BC, more than a thousand years before the Masoretic text was copied. Now, unfortunately, Genesis chapter 11 was not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But whenever the Greek Septuagint and the Hebrew Masoretic text disagree, the Dead Sea Scrolls usually side with the Greek Septuagint more often than with the Masoretic, like in Psalm 145, for example. Paul the Apostle quotes the Old Testament more than a hundred times in the New Testament. And whenever the Greek and the Hebrew diverge, Paul usually sides with the Greek Septuagint, like in Galatians 3.17, which I pointed out in a previous video. And not just Paul, but other disciples as well. Take Stephen the Martyr, for example. In Acts 7.14, Stephen the Martyr says that when Jacob and all of Israel went down into Egypt, they consisted of 75 people total. In case you didn't notice, Stephen the Martyr is agreeing with the Greek. You see, in the Hebrew Masoretic text in Genesis 46:27, it says that when Jacob and all of Israel went down into Egypt, they consisted of 70 people total. Exodus 1:5 also says 70 people total. But in the Greek Septuagint, it says that they consisted of 75 people total. Exodus 1:5 also says 75 people total. So which was it? Was it 70 or was it 75? Well, Stephen the Martyr says in Acts 7:14 that they consisted of 75 people total. Stephen the Martyr agrees with the Greek Septuagint, not the Hebrew Masoretic. Now, why would Stephen do that? After all, didn't Stephen know Hebrew? Or did the Hebrew text back then say something different? That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls come in. In 1947, they found these ancient Hebrew scrolls that predate the Masoretic text by more than a thousand years. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found Exodus chapter 1, verse 5, and guess what it said? It said that Jacob and all of Israel consisted of 75 people total. The Dead Sea Scrolls provide undeniable evidence that when Stephen the Martyr sides with the Greek Septuagint, it's not because he's disagreeing with the Hebrew. It's because he is agreeing with the original Hebrew. Even Jesus himself sides with the Greek Septuagint. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus quotes a passage of scripture from Isaiah 61, where he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. In this passage of scripture, Jesus uses the phrase, and recovery of sight to the blind. If you look up Isaiah 61 in the Greek Septuagint, then you'll find that it includes that phrase, and recovery of sight to the blind. But if you look it up in the Hebrew Masoretic text, then you'll find that that phrase is completely missing from the text. And since all of our Bibles are translated from this corrupted copy of the Hebrew, then all of our Bibles are missing that phrase from Isaiah 61. But even Jesus himself confirmed that it's in the original Hebrew. Even Jesus himself sides with the Greek Septuagint. When atheists say that Egyptian history predates Noah's flood, they think that they're disproving the Bible. But they're not. They're simply pointing out an error in the Hebrew Masoretic text. But even Jesus and his disciples discredit the Masoretic text from time to time. You see, they're assuming that the biblical date for the flood was 2350 BC. But according to these three manuscripts, it's not. So if they're right that Egyptian history predates that, 
then this actually verifies the testimony of these three manuscripts and therefore confirms the accuracy of the original Hebrew from which Jesus and his disciples were quoting. There are errors that we know about. Why? Because we can compare the documents, we can compare the manuscripts and see where the errors are. Let's say you have, here's the original, which we don't have. We don't, at least we, we, we don't think we have any original documents, okay? So they're all copies, okay? Uh, and let's say you find four different copies. And in the first copy, you see an error right here. And then uh, another copy, there's another error right there. In the third copy, there's another error right there. And in the fourth copy, there's an error right there. Can you reconstruct the original? Yes. Yes. And that's what scholars do. So yes, sometimes scribe made mistakes, but in virtually all cases, we know what the mistake was and we can correct it by comparing it with other documents. Now, you might say, why wouldn't God just, if this is true, why wouldn't he just maintain the original? If I had the original, what could I do to it? I could alter it, right? But if you had a copy, 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 and I had a copy, and I changed my copy, is everyone going to know who changed their copy? Yeah, because when you get all your copies together and compare it to mine, you go, Turk, you heretic, why'd you do that? Right? So by not preserving the original, you actually are able to preserve the original better.